yeah, uh, thanks, Omar. Uh, can you see the slides now? Or maybe we should make it full yes. screen. Yeah, is it good now? Yeah. Yeah, this looks good. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, so first I would like to thank uh, the organizers for arranging uh, my nice uh, courses this summer uh, and also for giving me the chance to, to give a course. Uh, so this course will be uh, about uh, Shram Levin Revolutions or SLE. Uh, so in the first two lectures, we will be studying uh, SLEs uh, via what is called uh, Levin chains. Uh, and uh, I will give uh, the definition of SLE and present some uh, basic properties of, of SLE. Uh, uh, so in the third lecture, we will be studying something called uh, imaginary geometry. Uh, so this is very, giving uh, a very uh, useful alternative perspective on, uh, on SLE. Uh, the third lecture will be uh, rather independent from the first two, so it's possible to follow, uh, to follow the third lecture, although you haven't followed everything in the first two uh, lectures. Uh, the first two lectures will be mostly based on, um, uh, on a book by uh, Lawler on SLE and also on some lecture notes by Barry Stuckey and uh, Norris, uh, while the third lecture will be uh, based on the imaginary geometry papers of uh, Miller and Sheffield, uh, in particular the first one, but also, uh, but also a little bit from the later ones. Uh, yeah, I, and as Omar mentioned, uh, I can also um, also repeat that uh, Mattis Lemkuller will uh, be answering um, uh, answering some questions uh, that might come up uh, during the talk. Uh, so he will be sitting in the chat, and he might also interrupt me if if something should be addressed uh, in front of everyone. Um, okay, so uh, SLE curves, uh, they are curves that arise as uh, as the scaling limit of uh, discrete models, uh, and I will show you a few examples of this. Uh, but first, we will be looking at an even more uh, well-known scaling limit, limit result, which is, uh, which is uh, um, uh, that the simple random walk is converging to Brownian motion. So here we have a girl who's doing a simple random walk on uh, Z2. Uh, so after she's taken one step, her path looks like this. Uh, after about 15 steps, uh, her path uh, looks like this. Uh, after a few thousand steps, uh, her path uh, may look like this. Um, and then it's a well-known result uh, that when we make the lattice finer and finer and we send time to infinity, uh, then, then the path of, of this girl is converging in law uh, to a planar uh, Brownian motion. Um, so, uh, so the schramm levin revolution is arising as the scaling limit of other discrete models. Uh, and uh, one example of this uh, is what is called the loop erased uh, random walk. Uh, so the loop erased random walk is closely related to the simple random walk. Uh, so again, this girl is doing a simple random walk uh, on uh, Z2. Uh, so, um, so at some point in time, uh, her path will make a loop, for example, like this. Uh, and every time her path is making a loop, uh, she's erasing that loop. Uh, at this point in time, her path has made uh, a loop again, uh, and again, uh, she's erasing it. Uh, and then it was proved by uh, Lola Schramm and Werner uh, that when we make the lattice finer and finer and we send uh, time to infinity, uh, then this loop erased random walk uh, is converging to uh, a schramm learn revolution. Uh, a schramm learn revolution uh, is always associated with some parameter kappa. Uh, and in the case of the loop erased random walk, uh, this parameter uh, is uh, kappa is equal to two, uh, which is why we call it uh, an SLE2. Uh, so Lola, uh, so uh, in the result I described here, we considered a simple random walk on, uh, on Z2, uh, but Lola Schramm and Werner also proved that uh, if we consider the loop erased random walk on some, on some other lattice uh, on which the simple random walk is converging to Brownian motion, then this uh, loop erased random walk is still converging uh, to SLE2 uh, on, on, on that lattice. Uh, okay, so um, SLE is also rising as the limit of a completely different model. Uh, so it's also rising as the limit of, of critical percolation. Uh, so, um, yeah, so here uh, I've chosen some arbitrary simply connected domain, uh, which happens to be uh, this uh, rectangle. Uh, and there are two fixed points, uh, A and B, uh, on the boundary uh, of this domain. Uh, I've also considered uh, the triangular lattice uh, restricted uh, to this box. Uh, and I colored one boundary arc between A and B, B, A and B blue, and the other one is colored in, uh, in yellow. Uh, so in the setting, one can draw a unique interface between blue and, uh, and yellow. Uh, and it was proved by Stanislas Murnov uh, that if we keep uh, the size and shape of the box fixed and we make the lattice finer and finer, then this uh, interface between blue and yellow is converging in the scaling limit uh, to, uh, to an SLE. Uh, and this time it will be uh, an SLE with parameter kappa uh, equal to six. 
so then um, a, a third example uh, is the uniform spanning tree. Uh, so again, we consider some arbitrary simply connected uh, domain. Uh, and we have, um, uh, which again is, is a box, um, which happens to be a box. And then I have, um, uh, here I have considered a spanning tree uh, on, this, uh, on this graph. Uh, so a spanning tree is a subset of the edges, which is uh, spanning all the vertices. So it covers all the vertices. Um, and it also, uh, it's also connected and it contains uh, no, uh, no cycles. Uh, so there are finitely many such spanning trees, uh, and I choose uh, such uh, trees as spanning tree uniformly at, uh, at random. Uh, in this uh, picture, uh, I have chosen to mark points A and B at the boundary, uh, and I require that uh, all of uh, the edges on the arc between A and B uh, are part of uh, the spanning tree, uh, but otherwise uh, I've still chosen the spanning tree uniformly at, um, at random. Um, okay. Uh, so then uh, it's possible to draw uh, the piano curve. Uh, so the piano curve is a curve connecting A and B uh, and which is tracing around the boundary of, uh, of the spanning tree. Uh, so this is uh, the same uh, picture again, um, but where, the, um, but where uh, the lattice has been made finer. Uh, and then it was also proved by Lawler, Schramm and Werner uh, that in the scaling limit, uh, this piano curve uh, is converging to an SLE. Uh, and this is an SLE with parameter kappa equal to, uh, to eight. Uh, and they, and uh, they proved this by using a close relationship between the looperized random walk and uh, the uniform uh, spanning tree. Um, okay, so, uh, so in order to introduce uh, strong learning revolutions, we will need uh, quite a bit of complex uh, analysis. Uh, and I start by recalling what uh, a conformal map is. Uh, so a map, uh, so we have a map F, um, which is defined on some um, open domain D uh, in the complex plane, and which takes values uh, in a domain D tilde, uh, also in the complex plane. Uh, so this map is uh, conformal uh, if F is uh, bijective and if the derivative of F uh, exists. Uh, so in the literature, there is actually also another uh, slightly different definition of conformal map. Uh, so sometimes one will see a definition where F is not required to be bijective, uh, but where one instead requires that the derivative of F uh, is non-zero everywhere. Uh, and that alternative definition is, is weaker than the one uh, we are considering here. Uh, so it's possible to show that if F is conformal, uh, then it satisfies the cauchy riemann equations. Uh, so identifying the complex plane with R2, uh, we can view f as a function from a subset of R2 to a subset of R2. Um, and um, by using that, um, that the derivative of f uh, exists, it's possible to show uh, that the coordinates functions uh, satisfy the relationships uh, shown uh, in the lemma. Um, yeah. Uh, so schramm lorentz evolutions uh, are what we call uh, conformally uh, invariant. Um, and um, um, and I will explain later what that is, uh, but first I will explain uh, what it means in the setting of uh, planar Brownian motion. Uh, so we let W be a planar Brownian motion uh, started from uh, the origin. Uh, then uh, we assume that D is some domain uh, in a complex plane containing the origin. And we let tau sub D uh, be the time uh, that, uh, that this Brownian motion is first exiting uh, D. Uh, then we had let F uh, be some conformal map uh, from D to some other domain uh, D tilde, which is fixing the origin. Then we'll let W tilde be the image of W under this map, uh, where we run W only until time uh, tau sub D. Uh, and then in this setting, uh, conformal invariance uh, means that uh, W tilde has the law of uh, a planar Brownian motion um, it, until it first leaves uh, D tilde. Um, yeah, so, um, so, uh, so in this uh, result, uh, we are viewing curves the modulo uh, time reparameterization. Uh, so, which means that if we have two different curves and we can get one from the other by reparameterizing the curve, then we view the two curves as, uh, as the same curve. Uh, so this theorem is saying that, uh, that this path W tilde, there is a way to reparameterize it such that uh, it has the law of uh, a Brownian uh, motion. Uh, so it is necessary to, uh, to state this result, mod modulo uh, reparameterization of time, uh, because of conformal map. Uh, locally, it looks like a composition of a translation, rotation, and a scaling. Uh, but this scaling will be different in different parts uh, of the domain. 
Uh, so in parts of the domain where we do a very big rescaling, small sum, scales on small set to a very big set, uh, then uh, the Brownian motion will move very fast in, in th these regions, while it will move slower in regions where we, uh, where we downscale um, uh, the domain. Um, uh, okay, so uh, so this figure um, uh, illustrates uh, the, the theorem. Uh, so in the left uh, figure, we have uh, a random walk on, on Z2. Uh, and in the right part of the figure, we have uh, the image uh, of, the, um, of the left part of the figure under uh, a conformal map. Um, so if we look at these two figures from a distance, we see that they are maybe not so different. So if we just zoom out and we ignore the small uh, details of the paths, uh, then uh, it's not so easy to see which uh, path is a random walk on, on Z2 and which one is a random walk on, uh, on the modified uh, lattice. Uh, and in the scaling limit, uh, these two paths will have uh, the exact same law. Um, yeah, so, so both of them will be uh, planar brown motions. Um, so uh, so in, in, in the right figure, uh, the path will move uh, faster in, in regions where the lattice is big and slower in regions where the lattice is, is smaller. Uh, but modular time reparameterizations, they will be uh, the same in, uh, in the scaling limit. Um, so the proof of, uh, of this uh, theorem, um, conformal invariance of brown in motion uh, is just uh, stochastic calculus. And I've left most of it uh, as an exercise. Um, so, um, so to prove it, uh, you can first define the coordinates functions um, w1 tilde and w2 tilde of uh, w tilde. Uh, and then it's possible to show by using uh, Ito's formula and uh, the Cauchy Riemann equations uh, that these two functions, um, that they are uh, local martingales. Uh, one can show that uh, the quadratic variation uh, of these two um, functions uh, are the same. Uh, and one can also show that the quadratic covariance is equal to zero. zero. Uh, so from these uh, three properties, um, uh, it's, one can use uh, one can use um, standard results in stochastic calculus um, uh, to uh, to deduce that uh, the process must be a planar uh, Brownian motion. Uh, so one can use the characterization result, uh, sometimes known as Lebesgue characterization of uh, of Brownian motion. Uh, so from the first two bullet points, one can get that. Uh, w1 tilde and w2 tilde, that each process um, is a time-changed uh, Brownian motion. Uh, from the second bullet point, uh, one also gets that the, time, that the time change is the same for the two processes. And from the third bullet point, one gets that uh, these two uh, processes are uh, independent of uh, each other. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say about uh, the planar Brownian motion for now. Um, and uh, the next uh, goal will be to uh, give a definition of SLE. Uh, but before doing that, I need to do uh, quite a bit more uh, complex analysis. Uh, so I start by uh, recalling uh, the Riemann mapping theorem. Uh, so the Riemann mapping theorem is saying that if D is some uh, simply connected uh, subset uh, or uh, simply connected domain in a complex uh, plane, uh, which is not equal to the full complex plane and which is not empty, uh, then there exists uh, a conformal map uh, from uh, D and to the unit disk. Uh, so this conformal map is not unique. Uh, and roughly speaking, we can say that when we choose this conformal map, uh, then we have uh, three degrees of, of freedom. Uh, for example, we can uh, choose three points, uh, A, B, and C, on the boundary of, of D. And then we can require that these are mapped to plus minus I uh, and one. Uh, so the reason we have these uh, three degrees of freedom is that if we uh, look at the set of conformal maps from the unit disk uh, to itself, uh, then this space of conformal maps can be parameterized by, uh, by three uh, real numbers. Um, okay, so, uh, so now uh, we assume that eta uh, is some curve um, in the upper half plane, which starts uh, at the origin and which ends at uh, infinity. Uh, so, for example, uh, eta uh, can be a simple curve, uh, such as shown in the left figure, so a curve which never visits the same point twice. Uh, it can also be a non-simple curve, as, as in uh, the right figure. So, in the right figure, you see a curve um, which is hitting its past multiple times, uh, but every time it hits its past, uh, it's, uh, um, uh, it's jumping off again uh, without uh, crossing the curve. Uh, so for now, I will not put any more restrictions on, on ADA, uh, but later the curves ADA we're interested in, they will typically also satisfy uh, some other constraints. Uh, so then we're defining a set uh, K sub T um, to be uh, the sets which are disconnected from infinity uh, by the curve uh, at time T. 
Uh, so one way to define the set, uh, one alternative way to define the set k sub d uh, is to first uh, run the curve uh, up until time t. Uh, so when we do this, uh, we will uh, get um, then the set h minus the curve will consist of one or more uh, connected components. Uh, and then there will be a unique uh, unbounded uh, component. Uh, and we define k sub d uh, to be h uh, minus this uh, unbound, unbounded uh, component. Uh, so in the left figure, k sub t will simply be the curve uh, run until time t. Uh, in the right figure, uh, then uh, k sub t will be the union of uh, the domains that are disconnected from infinity at time uh, t. Um, and then it will be uh, the union of, of, of these domains and uh, the curve itself. Um, okay, um, and then, um, and then, uh, so the set um, H minus uh, K sub T, uh, that will be a simply uh, connected uh, subset of, uh, of the complex plane. Uh, and by the Riemann mapping theorem, uh, it follows that there exists uh, some conformal map uh, from H minus K sub T uh, and to the upper half plane. Uh, and we also require that this, um, that this conformal map, which we call G sub D, that it sends uh, infinity uh, to infinity. Uh, so uh, in the figure, I've illustrated this uh, in the setting of a simple curve. Uh, so what you can imagine is that you um, have the upper half plane, uh, you take up a scissor and then you uh, cut uh, the curve uh, and then you cut along the curve. Uh, so you make a slit in the upper half plane uh, starting at zero, then you cut along the curve until you reach the point uh, eta of T. Uh, so this will give you a slit domain where the curve has been removed, uh, and this and this slit domain is what you are mapping uh, to the upper half plane uh, via uh, this map uh, g sub t. Uh, so it's possible to argue uh, that in this uh, setting, then uh, the tip of the curve uh, can be ma uh, is mapped to a unique point on on the real line. So this uh, map g sub t that I just defined it extends continuously to the tip of of the curve, and is mapped to some unique point on the real line. Uh, it's also possible to show that g sub t is extending in a certain sense to the to the curve itself and also to the real line. Uh, so if we look at the left part of the curve, then that is mapped to some interval on uh, on the real line, uh, which is lying to to the left of of the image of the tip. Uh, while if we look at the right side of the curve eta, then that is mapped to some uh, other interval on the real line, which is uh, to the right of of the image of uh, of the tip. Uh, so these two intervals are shown in uh, in red on the figure. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so that's um, the def so that's uh, g sub t. Uh, so it's um, so we can um, so we can look at the expansion uh, of this map g sub t around uh, infinity, uh, and I claim that it has an expansion uh, on the shown form. Um, so I will not give a full proof of why we have such uh, an expansion, um, but um, um, but what, the one way to prove it is to look at the map uh, g tilde sub t uh, that I have defined below. Um, so this map uh, g tilde sub t, so that will send uh, the upper half plane minus some uh, slit uh, to the upper half plane. And since g sends uh, infinity to, to infinity, then g tilde sub t will send zero to zero. Uh, so then it's possible to argue by something known as uh, Schwartz uh, reflection uh, that um, this map uh, g tilde sub t, uh, that it extends to some uh, conformal map, which is also defined in some neighborhood uh, around the origin. And it's also possible to show that uh, this uh, extended map, it maps uh, points on the real line to points on the real line. Uh, so by using that we have uh, such a uh, that we have a map which is defined in, in the neighborhood of the origin, we can uh, consider the Taylor expansion of this map. And we also see that all the coefficients in the expansion has to be real, since points on the real line are mapped to points on the real uh, line. Uh, so now we can, uh, by using the expansion uh, that we have for G tilde around zero, uh, and by using the relationship between uh, G tilde and G, uh, then we can get that uh, G sub T has, has uh, the shown uh, expansion. Uh, so then uh, we can fix uh, g sub t by requiring that the first coefficient in this expansion is equal to, to zero and the second is equal, no, is equal to one and the second is equal to, uh, to zero. Uh, so roughly speaking, this is uh, uniquely determining the map g sub t uh, because I said earlier that we have uh, three degrees of uh, freedom uh, when we choose the map uh, g sub t. 
so the formal proof that this is uniquely determining G sub T is maybe done in a slightly different way, but heuristically uh, speaking, uh, these three degrees of freedom is the reason that this uniquely uh, determines um, G sub T. Um, okay, so um, so the map, uh, so the set K sub T, uh, we call it the whole uh, at time T. Uh, and we say that uh, G sub T, we call, we call that function, uh, the mapping out function uh, at uh, time T. Uh, so one small remark uh, is that at this uh, slide, I considered a collection of sets, k sub t, indexed by time. I also considered, considered a collection of functions, uh, g sub t. Uh, so they're also indexed by time, um, but uh, the time parameterization is not really important for uh, anything that I've done on this slide. Uh, so we can define a compact HL to be a bounded subset of age, such that the complement is open and uh, simply connected. And if we have an arbitrary uh, compact HL, then it is possible to associate it with a mapping out function G uh, in a similar manner as I did uh, on the compact uh, on this slide. So the fact that we had the time parameterization was not really important for, for the definition of, uh, of these uh, objects, of the objects on, uh, on this slide. Um, okay. Um, so then uh, we have, um, we recall from the previous slide, uh, that we have a function uh, g sub t, uh, which is mapping the complement of uh, k sub t uh, to the upper half line. Uh, and the expansion of this, uh, of this map around infinity is looking like uh, z plus uh, zero plus uh, lower order terms. Uh, so the first coefficient here that I have not fixed uh, is the coefficient uh, a minus one in front of uh, one over z. Uh, and it turns out that this coefficient is, is very important and that it, uh, and that it gives a, a natural way to measure the size uh, of the set k sub t. Uh, so I define uh, the half plane capacity of uh, k sub t. Uh, I define it to be this uh, coefficient uh, a minus one. Uh, so I'm claiming that this coefficient a minus one is, is a natural way to measure the size of, uh, of k sub t. Uh, and but in order to justify that this is a natural uh, definition, uh, this uh, half plane capacity needs to satisfy some natural properties. For example, it's in order for it to be a natural definition, it's necessary that if we uh, increase the set uh, k sub t, then this half plane capacity is, is also increasing. Uh, and uh, such a monotonicity property is, uh, is given by the next uh, lemma. Uh, so the next lemma is giving an additivity property. So uh, it says that the half plane capacity uh, at time uh, t plus s uh, is equal to the half plane capacity at time t uh, plus the half plane capacity uh, of the set uh, of, of the remainder of, uh, of the curve, um, uh, which we see after uh, mapping out um, at time t. Uh, so in the setting of, of the figure, uh, we can look at the curve uh, on, the neck, uh, on the left picture. Uh, so the lemma is saying uh, that the half-plane capacity of this curve is equal to the half-plane capacity of this uh, initial blue segment uh, plus the half-plane capacity of this uh, red uh, dashed curve, uh, which is shown in uh, the middle figure. Uh, so here, the left and the middle figure are related uh, by the map G sub t, which is mapping out uh, the initial segment uh, K sub t. Um, yeah, so, uh, so the proof of this lemma um, is following from uh, the picture. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, so uh, to get from, as I said, to get from the left uh, picture to the middle pic picture, then we map out with a map uh, G sub T. Then to get from the middle, pic middle picture to the right picture, then we map out uh, again uh, by mapping out this, uh, this red uh, dashed curve. Uh, so, so if you look at um, first look at the control map uh, G sub t, uh, then the expansion of this map will be z plus um, a minus one uh, times one over c plus lower lower order terms. Uh, and by the definition of half plane capacity, um, the coefficient a minus one uh, is the half plane capacity of uh, k sub t. Uh, similarly, we can look at uh, the second time we map out. Uh, so we can also expand uh, this map around infinity. Uh, and now we see that uh, the coefficient uh, b minus one in front of one over z, we see that that uh, gives us the half-line capacity of this uh, red dashed curve uh, in, the middle, uh, in the middle figure. Uh, okay, so we have these two, uh, we are mapped out twice. Uh, we can also look at the composed map. Uh, so we compose these two mapping out functions, and then we'll look at the expansion of this uh, composed map uh, around infinity. 
And what we will see is that it can be written on the form uh, z plus zero uh, plus, um, plus um, a minus one plus b minus one times one over z. Uh, so what we can observe now um, is that this uh, composed map, it's actually also on the, on the form of uh, a mapping out function. Uh, and it is uh, a map uh, which sends the complement of the original curve uh, to the upper half plane and which has, has the expansion around infinity, which is characterizing a mapping out function. Uh, so this, uh, this composed map is actually uh, the mapping out function of the original curve. Uh, so um, yeah, so uh, by, by using this, um, we see that the half plane capacity of uh, the left curve is actually a minus one plus a b minus one, because this is the coefficient of one over z uh, in, uh, in this um, uh, mapping out function of, of the curve. Um, okay, uh, so then um, uh, another natural property that this half plane capacity is uh, satisfying uh, is that it also satisfies uh, some uh, scaling property. Uh, so if we have some set and we rescale it by R, then the half plane capacity is, is, is the scaling like uh, R squared. Um, so uh, the way to prove uh, this lemma is that we can define uh, some function G tilde sub T to be a rescaled version uh, of the original mapping out function. Uh, and then we can observe that this function G tilde sub T, that that is the mapping out function of this uh, rescaled uh, set. Uh, so you can ask, how can we see that this function g uh, tilde sub t is the mapping out function? Uh, so, uh, so we can um, see this by, uh, by expanding it around uh, the origin. Uh, and then we see that it has, uh, that it has the, the expansion um, of a mapping out function since it starts with uh, z plus zero, and then it, it's followed by lower order uh, terms. Uh, we can also see that a G tilde, it maps uh, the complement of the rescaled re set uh, to the upper half plane, and it maps infinity to infinity. Uh, so it satisfies uh, all the requirements uh, of the mapping out function of uh, the rescaled set. Uh, so therefore, it, it has to be the mapping out function of, uh, of that set. Uh, so now, uh, if you look at this expansion of uh, G tilde uh, sub T around uh, infinity, uh, then we see that the coefficient of one over z uh, will be uh, r squared times the corresponding uh, coefficient uh, of uh, the original map uh, g sub t. Uh, and this tells us that r squared uh, times this original coefficient is uh, the half plane capacity of uh, the rescaled set. Uh, and this uh, gives us uh, the lemma since this, yeah, this coefficient is, uh, is the half plane capacity. Um, okay, so uh, now I have spoken for approximately 30 minutes, uh, so then I think we can take uh, a short two minute break, just in case um, someone, someone has any questions or if people want to look again at some previous slides. Um, yeah, so then I will, I can just stop the, um, stop the sharing. Uh, no, uh, yeah, okay. Can I the, should... oh, okay. You can leave the shares out the screen okay. share. Yeah. Thank you. And there is a comment from Mathis on the okay. chat. Okay. That, uh, okay, I will. Uh, I can. Uh, about the nutrition uh, for the half plane capacity. But... But, uh, if there are any questions at this point, uh, please feel free to ask on the chat. Yeah. So what? Um, yeah. So what Mathis is saying is a very. Yeah. That's also a very. Uh, that's an alternative way to define uh, the half plane capacity, which, yeah, which is also, um, uh, yeah, which is it's very different, and it's yeah, it's it's often, um, uh, yeah, it gives gives some some other intuition, and it's also very often very useful to to use in proofs. Uh, this alternative um, definition that Mathis is is giving. Okay, so if there are any questions, ask on chat. If not, we will continue in a couple of minutes. Yeah.
Should I start again now or should we do a few more minutes? What do you think? Okay, I can't I can't hear anyone now. I think everyone Yes, I think yeah. things are fairly clear. Okay. So, yeah, okay. Then I'll I'll continue now. Um okay, so um yeah, so uh, we have seen on, on this slide uh, that this half plane capacity, um, it's giving uh, a natural way to measure the size of some uh, set, uh, K sub T. Um, and because it satisfies these two natural uh, properties, additivity and scaling. Uh, and, um, uh, and when we look at uh, curves um, in the upper half plane, then most of the time we will assume that it has been uh, parameterized by half plane capacity. Uh, so by that, I mean that we parameterize the curve uh, such that the half plane capacity of the set uh, K sub T uh, is given by uh, two times T uh, for any T. Um, okay, so um, here in the next slide, I will introduce uh, two very important objects. Uh, so uh, the first object I will int introduce um, is what I call the driving function. Um, so um, yeah, so on, on this slide, I will also assume just for simplicity that eta is a simple curve, um, but much of what I'm saying is also working for a more general curves. Um, yeah, so um, as you remember that when uh, the curve is simple, uh, then uh, it's possible to argue that when we apply uh, this map uh, G sub T, uh, then the tip of the curve uh, is mapped to a unique point on uh, the real line. Uh, and um, uh, and we can, and we denote this point uh, by uh, W of t. Uh, and it turns out that this uh, that W of t, uh, when we change t, then it, it's uh, changing, uh, then it is a continuous uh, function. Uh, okay, so uh, the second um, uh, the second uh, uh, object I want to introduce uh, is uh, the Lerner equation. Uh, so the Lerner equation is uh, the differential equation uh, shown on the slide. Uh, so as you can see, uh, for each uh, point z uh, in the upper half plane, uh, then uh, it tells us how uh, the, uh, how, uh, the image of z under the map g sub t uh, is changing uh, when we vary uh, t. Uh, and uh, here I am using, uh, when I write a dot over, uh, over the letter g, then I mean that we take uh, a time derivative. Uh, so you can see that for each, uh, each z, uh, we have an ordinary differential equation, which, uh, which uh, describes how this point uh, z is mapped when we vary t. Uh, and uh, we can define tau sub z uh, to be uh, the set, uh, to be uh, the time, um, and uh, to be um, uh, the first time, or the infimum of times uh, at which z is contained in uh, k sub t. And it turns out that this uh, differential equation is uh, well defined uh, exactly until uh, tau sub z. Uh, for, for many points, tau sub z uh, could be, be infinite, but for some points, it, it, will, be, uh, it will be finite. Uh, so what happens when uh, t is equal to tau sub z is that then uh, the denominator on the right side uh, of this um, of this differential equation uh, will be equal to zero. So then the derivative is, is no longer uh, well-defined. Uh, okay, so I want to uh, show you a simulation of this, um, uh, of this uh, Loebner flow. Um, so yeah, so I have that here. Uh, so this is uh, a simulation which was made by uh, Henry Jackson, uh, who used to be a PhD student in, um, uh, in Cambridge. Um, so in the left part of, um, in the left part of this, uh, uh, of this um, figure, uh, you can see the upper half line and the curve. And in the right part of this figure, uh, you can see what happens when we apply this, uh, these mapping out functions, uh, G sub T. Uh, so it's illustrating uh, g sub t uh, when we're varying t from infinity, uh, not from zero, to some uh, large number. Uh, so if we, uh, so we can fix uh, the video at some fix at some time, so we assume that the conformal map at this point in time is given by g sub t. Uh, so then, um, uh, if you look at the left part of the figure, then the curve until time uh, t is shown in blue, and the rest the, and the rest of the curve is shown in uh, in black. 
Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so what you can see, so, um, okay, so we can go back to uh, the starting point. Uh, so at uh, time uh, zero, you can choose some point uh, in the right part of the figure. And then when I uh, start the video again, you can see uh, what happens with this point. So what you will observe is that uh, the point you chose, that it's, that it's flowing downwards. Uh, and, and the differential equation, which is describing how this point is moving, uh, that, um, that uh, so, so the movement of that fixed point is exactly described uh, by this uh, Loewner uh, differential equation. So, so, uh, so as you remember, for each fixed point Z, we have, we have, a, we have such a differential equation. Uh, another thing you can look at, so you can look at uh, the point of, in, uh, you can look at the intersection uh, between the curve uh, and the real line uh, in the left part of the figure. Uh, yeah, so that's not so visible now, but if I go back a little bit in time, then you can see that the point of intersection between the curve and the real line is oscillating up and down. Uh, and this point of intersection uh, is exactly given by, uh, so this is exactly described by this uh, driving function W of, uh, of T. Uh, and in the in the example uh, we see here, then this driving function is actually a constant multiple of uh, of a Brownian motion. Uh, another thing you can see is these times uh, tau sub uh, z. Uh, so in this case, uh, for almost all points of the domain, um, tau sub z will be infinity because this learner flow is is well defined for all times. Uh, but for those particular points which lie on the curve. Uh, then uh, tau sub z will be uh, finite, um, and tau sub z will be given by the point that uh, the curve uh, is hitting uh, the point. Uh, yeah, so um, tau sub z um, uh, will be equal yeah, to the time that, uh, that the curve is hit. Uh, okay, so I think that's all I wanted to say about that uh, simulation. Uh, so then uh, we can go back to the slides. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so um, uh, yeah, so here we have, um, yeah, so now I've introduced the driving function and uh, the learner equation. Um, so um, yeah, so. Uh, then we will go to Schramm's uh, idea. Uh, so when Schramm uh, introduced SLE, uh, then he was interested in understanding the scaling limit of uh, discrete models, uh, such as the Luperace random walk, uh, percolation, and uh, the uniform spanning tree. Um, and uh, so, he, uh, so he assumed that, uh, that uh, these models had scaling limits, um, and he looked at properties uh, of, of the limiting curve. So we assume now that uh, ADA is representing the scaling limit of, uh, of one of these uh, discrete models. Uh, so one of uh, Otto Schramm's uh, realizations was that instead of uh, studying the curve ADA, one can equivalently study this uh, driving function uh, W. Um, because if we have a curve ADA, then we can get the family of uh, functions G sub T, which again gives us the driving function uh, W. Uh, or conversely, if we have the driving function W, then we can uh, re uh, then we can reconstruct uh, the curve uh, eta. Um, yeah. So uh, what Odetram did? So he looked at the properties that this conjectural uh, limiting curve uh, eta is satisfying, uh, and he looked at what those properties uh, tell us about properties of, of W. Uh, and what he, he realized is that if W, now if Eta describes the scaling limit of the discrete models he was interested in, then uh, W actually has to be a, a constant multiple of uh, a Brownian motion. Uh, because he, he saw that from properties of the discrete models, it was natural uh, to believe um, that Eta would have properties which imply that W has um, IID increments and which satisfies uh, Brownian scaling. Uh, and from uh, these two, and we know that uh, the unique process satisfying these properties uh, is a constant multiple of, uh, of uh, a Brownian motion. Um, okay, so, um, uh, yeah, so uh, finally, we are ready to give uh, the definition of, uh, of SLE. Uh, so to define SLE um, in the upper half plane, then uh, we start by choosing some parameter kappa, uh, and then we'll let B be a standard uh, Brownian motion. Uh, then we set W equal to square root of kappa times B, and then we solve uh, the Loebner equation uh, where the driving function is given by, uh, by uh, W. Uh, and then we uh, let uh, K sub T um, be the set uh, 
uh, um, set of points in a complex plane uh, such that tau uh, sub z uh, is less than or equal to t. Uh, so, cal so k sub t is the set of points in the complex plane uh, for which the Logan differential equation is no longer uh, well defined at time t. Uh, and then we let uh, eta uh, be the curve, uh, which is uh, generating k sub t. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, so what it means that uh, eta is generating k sub t. So that means uh, what I have described in the first of uh, the smaller bullet points. Um, so we see, and, and then we say that uh, we define an SLE in the upper half plane from zero to infinity uh, to be a curve eta, which has been sampled in, uh, in this way. Uh, so you can see that, uh, that uh, this procedure for sampling eta is also illustrated in the lower figure. We start with the Brownian motion. This gives us um, conformal maps g sub t, which again gives us the sets k sub t, which uh, finally gives us uh, eta. Uh, so the first two steps uh, I have described here uh, are quite straightforward uh, in the sense that it's not so uh, difficult to see that, uh, that these are uh, well-defined. Um, but the third step of this procedure, getting eta from k, uh, is not so straightforward. Uh, and it's not so straightforward because it's not so easy to see that, um, that these sets, uh, k sub t, uh, are generated uh, by a curve. Um, so there are, many, there are many possible ways to, um, to define growing sets uh, in the upper half plane, which have not been generated uh, by a curve. And it's not obvious that if we solve the Lovren differential location with a driving function given by this Brownian motion, then the resulting sets, k sub t, uh, will be generated by, uh, by a curve. Um, but it, it was proved uh, by Roda and Schramm uh, that, um, uh, that uh, the sets, k sub t, obtained in this way, that they, that they are generated by curves uh, with probability 1. Uh, so Rod and Trump, they proved it for kappa, kappa not equal to 8, uh, and then in the case kappa equals to 8, then it follows from the work of Lola, Schramm and Werner, uh, who proved uh, that, um, that uh, SLE 8 is arising as the limit of uh, the uniform uh, spanning tree. Um, okay, so uh, this is the definition of SLE in the upper half plane, uh, connecting 0 and infinity. Uh, so in general, uh, if we have some general domain D, uh, we assume a D is simply connected, uh, and uh, we assume that A and B are uh, fixed boundary points on D, uh, then the slide here gives uh, the definition of SLE in, uh, in this domain. Um, so to define SLE in this domain, then we first let uh, A dot tilde uh, be an SLE in the upper half line connecting zero and infinity. Uh, then we consider a map F, which is conformal and which uh, sends the upper half plane to D and which sends zero to A and infinity to B. Uh, and then uh, we um, uh, say that, and then we define eta to be the image of eta tilde under this conformal map. And we say that eta uh, is a curve which has the law of um, an SLE in the domain uh, D with marked points at uh, A and uh, B. Um, so when you see this uh, definition, uh, the first thing you may ask um, is, is whether this is well defined. Uh, and the reason that this is a good question is that this map F, which is appearing in the definition, uh, it's not unique. Um, so if you did a rescaling of uh, the upper half plane uh, before applying this conformal map, then you would still have a conformal map from the upper half plane uh, to D, which sends zero to A and which sends affinity to B. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so you can ask whether uh, whether this SLE that we just defined, whether it depends on this choice of the uh, conformal map. Um, but it can be, be argued uh, that SLE as defined here uh, is well defined. Um, and the reason is uh, scale invariance in, in law uh, of SLE in uh, the upper half plane. Uh, and I've left uh, the proof of this uh, as an exercise. Um, so we let uh, eta be some SLE in the upper half line from zero to infinity, and we let r be bigger than zero. Uh, then we define a new curve, which is uh, a rescaling of the original curve. Uh, and then the exercise is uh, to show that this rescaled curve uh, also has the law of an SLE uh, in the upper half plane. Uh, so I've also written a hint. Uh, so one hint is to I let eta tilde um, denote this uh, rescale curve, uh, then define g tilde sub t uh, to be uh, the mapping out functions of this uh, rescaled curve. 
uh, and then uh, argue that um, that uh, G tilde sub T is satisfying uh, the, uh, the relationships which are shown in, uh, in the indented equation. So where G sub T is representing the mapping out function of, of the original curve uh, eta. Um, yeah, uh, so the first thing you can notice is that the rescaling of the curve eta tilde uh, has been, so when I defined eta tilde, I also rescaled time by R squared. Uh, and by the by the scaling properties of the half plane capacity, it follows from this that a dot tilde is is also parameterized by um, half plane capacity. Um, yeah, so um, so what you can see um, is that in the indented equation, you see that um, you see that um, uh, g tilde is also satisfying uh, the Lerner equation, and you see that it satisfies the Lerner equation uh, with a, a rescaled version of uh, of the original uh, driving function uh, W. Uh, but now, um, in order to conclude the proof, you can observe that this rescaled version of the driving function that that is uh, is also uh, that had also has the law of uh, of a Brownian motion, and by and this follows by by Brownian scaling. Uh, so by using this, you can see that uh, G tilde uh, sub T is also satisfying uh, the Lerner equation with with driving function given by uh, a Brownian motion. Uh, and then you can use uh, use that to uh, to conclude. Um, okay. Uh, so now we have um, uh, we have the definition of, of SLE. Uh, so um, yeah, I will say uh, a little bit um, a little bit more before before I finish. Um, so. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, Otto Tram he introduced um, SLE because uh, while he was studying scaling limits of uh, of several discrete models, um, and uh, he realized that if these um, discrete models uh, have scaling limits, then these uh, scaling limits would have uh, two properties in common, uh, and these properties are uh, conformal uh, invariance and uh, the domain Markov property, uh, and these are the properties uh, that I will uh, introduce before I finish. Um, so, um, uh, so we want uh, we assume that D is some uh, simply connected domain uh, in the complex plane uh, with um, boundary with uh, two distinct points A and B uh, on the boundary, uh, and then for each such triple uh, D comma A comma B, uh, we assume that a mu sub D comma A comma B uh, is a probability measure on curves uh, in the D uh, which connect uh, which, which is connecting A and B. Uh, modular time reparameterization. Uh, so uh, it means that uh, we have a probability measure on curves, and again, we are identifying two curves uh, if we can get one from the other by uh, reparameterizing uh, time. Uh, so in the first bullet point, I, I just consider arbitrary probability measures, uh, but in the second bullet point, I introduce uh, one more constraint. Uh, so I assume that if we take uh, ADA and we sample it from the probability measure defined in the upper half plane, with mark points on zero and infinity, uh, then this curve uh, is almost surely uh, generated uh, by a learner chain. Uh, so maybe you ask, what does it mean that the curve is generated by uh, a learner chain? Uh, and by that, I mean that ADA is obtained by a similar procedure as what I have described here. Uh, so I say that ADA is generated by a learner chain if it can be uh, obtained by uh, solving the learner differential equation for some, for some driving function W, we're not, not anymore requiring that the W is a Brownian motion. Uh, and then we solve uh, G sub T, then we get that K sub T. Uh, and then finally we get um, ADA by saying that ADA is the curve uh, generating uh, K sub T. Um, yeah, so I assume that uh, ADA is obtained by, um, by, um, by a similar procedure uh, to this. Uh, and then um, uh, I say uh, that uh, that these probability measures that they are conformally invariant if the probability measure in n domain D uh, is related to the probability measure in D tilde uh, by a conformal map. So it means that uh, so if we sample a curve eta from uh, the probability measure in uh, D uh, and then we uh, compose it uh, with um, with some uh, conformal map. Uh, which is from the domain D to some other domain D tilde, then the resulting curve in, in D tilde will have, will have the law of, um, of, um, of a curve sampled from the measure in uh, this domain. Um, okay, so then uh, we also have um, the, the domain Markov property. 
so to redefine the domain Markov property, we assume that we uh, run uh, the curve eta until some stopping time uh, tau. Um, and then we condition uh, on this initial segment of the curve. Uh, and then the domain Markov property uh, is telling us, um, conditioned on uh, the initial segment of the curve, what is the conditional law uh, of the rest of, uh, of the curve. Uh, so the figure is illustrating um, this in the setting of uh, where uh, the curve is simple. Uh, so in this setting, we let k sub t be the curve run until time tau. Uh, yeah, we let k sub tau be the curve run until time tau. Uh, and then um, we see that the set uh, D minus K sub tau uh, is simply connected. Um, and we, um, when we also see that eta of T and B um, are two marked points on the boundary of this domain. Uh, so therefore, um, uh, therefore, we know that we have some probability measure um, mu, which is defined in, in this uh, domain uh, with the two marked uh, points. Uh, and then the domain Markov property is saying that uh, conditioned uh, on the initial segment of the curve, the rest of the curve uh, has the law of, um, of a curve which has been sampled from our probability measure in the slit domain uh, obtained by removing the initial uh, segment of, uh, of the curve. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, so this, these are the two um, uh, properties. Uh, so, um, so then, uh, Otto Tram uh, was proving that um, uh, that um, uh, that these probability measures they are conformally invariant and satisfy uh, the domain Markov property uh, if and only if uh, a curve sampled from one of these measures uh, is an SLE curve. Uh, so we proved that SLE curves they are conformally invariant and they satisfy the domain Markov property. Uh, and conversely, uh, if we have a family of measures satisfying these properties, then they have to be uh, SLE curves. Uh, and this theorem is exactly what uh, was motivating him uh, to um, uh, motivating him to to introduce uh, the SLE curves, because he uh, he realized that um, that many of the discrete models he were interested in, uh, they were uh, believed to have um, they were believed to be conformally invariant and satisfy uh, the domain Markov property uh, in the scaling limit. So by this theorem, uh, the only possible uh, scaling limit uh, are uh, SLE curves. Um, okay, uh, so um, yeah, so in the next slides, uh, I wanted to give you some more uh, intuition for uh, these two properties, conformal invariance and domain Markov property uh, in uh, the discrete setting. Um, so I think I will maybe be doing conformal invariance before we, before I finish. Uh, so um, uh, so uh, the, the measure mu sub d comma a comma b, it's typically representing the scaling limit of some uh, discrete model um, in the domain D with marked points A and B. For example, in the setting of percolation, then we can consider percolation restricted uh, to the domain uh, D, uh, where A and B uh, mark the points at which the boundary data change. Uh, and then um, mu sub d comma a comma b is representing um, the scaling limit of uh, the interface, of the discrete model in this uh, domain D. Uh, so then um, we can uh, do this procedure for two domains, D and D tilde, uh, and then conformal invariance. Uh, as I stated on the previous slide, conformal invariance means that the, these two probability measures mu defined in one defined in D and one defined in D tilde, that they are uh, related uh, by a conformal uh, map. Uh, okay, so I think that now I will uh, finish the presentation uh, for today. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, but before we end, uh, I can ask if there are any questions. Maybe. So uh, we will have uh, time for questions afterwards, I guess. But I think at this point, uh, we will unmute everyone uh, so that we can show our appreciation to Nina. 